So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome for this uh, first uh, Immunet and uh, Young Grappa um, joint webinar. I'm Jean Guillaume Notari. I'm a rheumatologist at Lille University Hospital, Lille, France, and a member of Immunet Visibility and Global Affairs Subcommittee. I will uh, co chair this webinar with Fabien Prot. I'll let him uh, introduce him. Um, so uh, on behalf of Yemenet and Grappa, we are very pleased to welcome you for this uh, first uh, webinar about a very topical issue, artificial intelligence and rheumatology. Uh, this webinar is very exciting and we have two brilliant speakers, uh, Dr. Diego Benavent and uh, Vicente Benerito. So just a few uh, instructions. This webinar will last one hour and include two 15 minutes presentations. At the end of each uh, talk, there will be a three minute session of questions. And at the end of the seminar, there will be uh, a session of exchange of discussion between the two uh, speakers and, and uh, the audience. So just a few, few uh, instructions. Please uh, check that you are mute during the presentations of our brilliant speakers. You could, of course, unmute uh, during the question sessions. Uh, feel free to ask uh, your question in the chat. We will transmit them to the speaker. And as we have a very tight uh, schedule, uh, we'll uh, now present Immunet and Young Rapa. So for Immunet, it's my pleasure to introduce Tue Karstrup. Tue is the Immunet Chair. He's a rheumatologist and associate professor in immunology and pharmacology. He got his uh, medical degree from Aarhus uh, University, uh, Denmark, and he also got his PhD from Aarhus, I expect that I pronounce well, University and Stanford University. So Tue, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jean-Guillaume. Um... Hello, everybody. So my name is uh, Tool. I'm the current chair of Eminet. So Eminet, who are we? So Eminet is uh, the emerging EULA network. So it's uh, sort of the young organization um, promoting um, the growth of prof professionals in, in, in rheumatology. And um, sort of the organizational aspect is that we are now actually a real EULA committee. So you will find Immunet if you go to the EULA website and click on communities, you will see Immunet along with pediatrics, um, health professionals and uh, patient uh, research partners. And it's, it's a really big community. Um, so it's more than 100 countries and more more than 3,400 members. And here you see the distribution throughout the, 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 um, all, all the countries. And we do lots of stuff. And I just have a few slides here because you need to go on with all the interesting uh, stuff uh, at this uh, webinar. But you can follow us on social media. Immunet is all on, the, on all of the platforms. Um, we have a podcast, we have a YouTube uh, channel. And there is obviously the webinars. So this is the webinar today, but there are um, mon monthly webinars and also webinars coming out from the Confiliation uh, Committee. But otherwise, I would say that the most interesting is probably when there is um, the possibility to meet people face to face. And this is obviously at the Congress. So here we have many activities. So you will see in the Congress app that uh, Immunet has its own tab with all the activities. So for instance, there is the research speed dating uh, and there are the mentor menti meetings, but otherwise there are also all the sort of the networking activities. You can come to the booth uh, or you can join uh, uh, the networking or the meetup um, meetups. A little bit of organization in the end. Um, so here you sort of see Immunet. This is all that is Immunet. So the community and the country liaison network and if you look a little closer, the, the committee is rather small. So it's only two, um, the two chairs and then the chairs of each of the subcommittees. So the, the, all the subcommittees are, are, are then termed the subcommittee. And this would be 62 people who are the people who are doing sort of all the voluntary work um, to organize these uh, activities. And this is um, who they are in the subcommittee currently. So you can see it's mostly early career 
rheumatologists or rheumatology trainees, and some are already consultants, but otherwise it's researchers within rheumatology, so either PhDs or, or postdocs. And currently the call is out. So if you're really, really interested in getting into the subcommittee, um, you can um, you can send us an application. We would really appreciate that. We need we need all the best organizers in rheumatology. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tue. So now I think we can move to the presentation of Jung Grappa. So uh, Fabien, the stage is yours. Thank you, Jean Guillaume, and thank you, Tue, because I think I can already very nicely connect to the presentation of Tue because I was just leaving the Emoinet um, subcommittee and that was really, yeah, it was devastating not being a part of the active group anymore, but still it feels really great that you can still be so strongly connected to Emoinet and the Emoinet activities. And therefore, I'm already uh, really appreciating being invited today to speak today on behalf of Young Grupper. And as you will see very shortly is that we used a lot of the Emoinet structure also when we were thinking about how we could build uh, up Young Grupper. And this was exactly the idea from my um, yeah, experiences that I gained within Emoinet I was thinking that we should have the same within Grappa because Grappa is a great organization. I really love the organization and it's also quite unique because here dermatologists and rheumatologists are working together interdisciplinary. And I think that this really um, improves the care for our patients when treating patients with psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis to have the interdisciplinary view not only targeting the joints or targeting only the skin, but combining this, this is really beneficial for the patients. And so I thought, okay, we should also have something to bring the younger colleagues closer to the ongoing uh, great uh, initiatives from Grappa. And so in 2021, um, um, I started the Young Grappa Initiatives, and this was very much appreciated from the whole Grappa Society. They were so supportive. And so I can um, already uh, yeah, share a little bit of the story how we build up Young Grappa over the last three and a half years. And um, so who are we? Uh, this is very similar um, to Emoinet. We are I either under 40, but we didn't want it to have uh, a discrimination because of age, because if you come later to medicine or whatsoever. So there are two different criteria, either being below the age of 40 or being within five years after finishing your training. And you can either be a full Grappa member or you can come as an early career member and therefore have an easier entrance into the Grappa community. And the idea is exactly like also, um, yeah, we borrowed this from Imonet to enhance collaboration and foster interactive um, collaboration between uh, senior Grappa members and younger colleagues and bridging the gap between those uh, connected. And so there are two ways, either you are already a full member and then you can directly apply for Young Grappa if you're either below 40 or within five years after finishing your training. Or if you are out there listening to the webinar today and say, well, PSA or PSO is a topic very close to my heart, my scientific and uh, clinical interest, then it would be so easy. You can uh, become an early career member. And the only thing you need for that would be having one Grappa member recommending you as an early career member. And then you can join Grappa as an early career member and directly also join Young Grappa and get involved in all the great activities that you have. And if you would be interested, um, you will be very happy. Uh, we would be very happy if you just uh, reach out to us and yeah, so to join us. Um, and since 2021, we uh, grow. And when we are looking at the numbers of eBoynet, we obviously don't have them now and we will never get them, but we are really strongly growing and we have a great representation. We have even a bit more females. I think this is also in line with what has happening in the past in medicine, but also in um, rheumatology. Um, we see that we have a slightly higher share of rheumatologists compared to dermatologists, but also within Young Grappa, we have the mixture of both dermatologists and rheumatologists with quite a, a broad representation across the globe. Um, this is the current leadership. So uh, I was the inaugural chair when we started Young Grappa in 2021. I still um, end my term as uh, chair. Leonike, also a member also of uh, Emoinet, is the past chair. And Andre will take over in the summer as the chair elect. Um, we also have subcommittees, which are quite similarly organized to Emoinet, um, driving all those uh, interesting topics uh, forward. And we also here, we really said, Grappa, you need to have a better visibility to, to the outside world. So we took over the Grappa social media channels 
and now have um, yeah, a respective person also within the Grappa administration helping us with this and really growing the Grappa um, social media presentation over the years. Um, we also have mentor mentorship meetings uh, because of COVID, we started them virtually and we will most likely continue this to be very inclusive so everyone can join. Um, we have also the newsletters, not as good as the Emonet newsletters under the lead of Diego, but we are trying to improve them as well. Um, and we also have the Congress highlights meetings. Um, and what is quite unique, and this is something that also from my perspective, Emonet could think about is that we are also after the Congresses, we are preparing the um, major highlights on PSO and PSA psoriatic diseases under the uh, guidance of senior Grappa members. And then we have a virtual, easy, accessible, cost-free event where we are discussing the hot topics from the Congress. And this is, I think, a very nice initiative because not everyone is able to go to the um, ACR meeting and have them delivered uh, at your home from peers around your um, community. I think this is very valuable and especially for us because currently the um, AAD Congress in San Diego again is taking place for dermatology, American College of um, Dermatology. And I will not be able going there but with this, I can still co consume the highlights from uh, the skin uh, community on psoriatic disease. And I think this is also something that uh, Imonet could think about having the major Congress highlights in the future. Um, and the first uh, or the next episode will take place on April 10th. So you can mark the calendar if you are interested to also hear about the highlights from the Dermatological Congress from the AAD. And um, this will be one and a half hours where young Grappa members will present the major highlights from the Dermatological Congress, Conference. Um, so without any further ado, I think we should go ahead because these things are quite likely uh, um, similar to what we have also heard about from Emonet. Um, just to be um, yeah, very yeah, open-minded again, we would love to have more people who are interested in psoriatic disease joining us with your enthusiasm and your expertise. And if you would like to join, please feel free to reach out and we would really uh, much welcome this. Um, furthermore, I think we have a really yeah, packed uh, program and distinguished faculty today. And uh, I think we should um, move ahead and hear about the unleashing potential from artificial intelligence and rheumatology in general. And yeah. So I think we can move to the first presentation. Thank you, Fabian. Uh, but first, I have a thought for uh, Christelle Awad, who should have a uh, co moderate with us, uh, but for personal issues, she was not able to attend. So uh, we'll, we'll start with our first presentation, presentation, as Fabian mentioned it. So, Dr. Diego Benavent is a rheumatologist at the University Hospital of Belvitege in Barcelona. He will defend his PhD in Asia's spondyloarthritis at Edipat Hospital, uh, Hospital La Paz. He has completed a master's degree in artificial intelligence and data science at the University of Alcala de Henares. He collaborates as a medical expert at Savannah, a medical company dedicated to research with artificial intelligence, mainly focused on natural languages processing. He's active in different, uh, different international groups, such as being a fellow in the patient outcomes in longitudinal studies, POLOS group in, uh, of OMERAC. He's an associate member of ASAS, part of the EULA Research Committee and the lead of uh, Immunet's newsletters uh, subcommittee. So, Diego, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Jan Guillaume, for this very kind presentation and especially for, for this invitation to uh, this webinar, which uh, is really special to me uh, to, be, to be here uh, surrounded by fantastic uh, Immunet and, and Jan Grappa colleagues. So can you see my presentation, right? Yeah, okay. So we will move away ahead uh, talking about advances of AI in rheumatology research and practice. And for this, I will ask all of you back home to make a little exercise of imagination and to imagine by thinking that someone from another planet comes to your house right after the talk and this alien, you need to explain them how the world works. You need to explain them basic stuff in the world. For example, you will start by explaining them what is a chair. And therefore you will explain them that a chair is somewhere where you can sit and it has four legs and it has a back of the seat. And then they will say, okay, perfect. We understand what a chair is. 
and then they will go to the street and they will say, yeah, we see many chairs. But indeed, that is not a chair and you will recognize that, that that's a bench and that's a different thing. You will tell them that a chair is normally a seat for one person and that's the difference with a bench. And therefore they will think that they perfectly understand what a chair is until they come to your university and they see this that doesn't fit the definition you gave them with four legs. And then you probably will start to realize that human mind doesn't work like that. It doesn't work with fixed rules that we follow. It works rather learning by experience. It's precisely how we learn medicine. Unlike a medical student that just studies their books with fixed criteria, fixed rules, medical practice and medical research requires thinking ahead requires learning from examples. And this is very important to understand because this is precisely what has happened lately in the computer software world in the latest year. So in 1987, there was a computer software called Deep Blue that defeated Gary Kasparov. But this computer software was trained throughout many years. We needed to teach it every single move in chess and every single possibility in thousands of hours of training. And the difference came in 2017 when a machine learning algorithm learned by itself chess in just four hours and it defeated Deep Blue by 30 to zero. It learned to play chess without any rules, just with the order that it needed to win. And it couldn't step, stop learning until it won. And this is basically artificial intelligence. It's we get the solution, and from there, we start learning how to get the problem. Basically, that's what predicting is. It's having data to predict, to anticipate the future. And for that, we obviously need data. And that's why some years ago, we started listening a lot about big data and all of that, because that helped to machine learning to implement in society. And sometimes something that we don't talk too many thing, times about is what artificial intelligence can do. And basically, in the latest year, we realized that it can do two basic tasks. It can do classification, understanding and segmenting things by characteristics, or it can do prediction, meaning anticipating in the timeline. And these two features correspond precisely with two tasks that we do in medicine, that are diagnosis and basically predicting by risk scores. And this happened some years ago in many different medical specialties, but the, the milestone was achieved first by ophthalmologists who first developed a deep learning algorithm that could diagnose diabetic retinopathy even better than ophthalmologists. That was very interesting, but the really interesting thing came afterwards when they realized that it could not only diagnose diabetic retinopathy, but could also know things that the ophthalmologist didn't know, such as the sex of the person, or even the cardiovascular risk, the Parkinson risk, the Alzheimer risk in seven years time. So after they started validating in external cohorts these models, and they have been implemented lately in different hospitals. There are some hospitals in the US that already have these models, and in Spain, I'm aware of at least three hospitals that are already using them. So. We thought that we were there, that we have, we were winning the game. We have this discriminative AA until November 30, 2022, that ChatGPT changed everything because it not only did classification and prediction, it created material, it created content, giving the opportunity to assist us, to help us in many different activities. For example, to uh, uh, help us doing a support system with clinical decision or to retrieve information from electronic health records. But for all of this, what we basically need again is data, data that can come from very different sources. So let's see where we can get the data from. Normally in medicine, we got the data in a structured databases, meaning databases with different roles, which are patients, and different columns, which are variables. And I think all of us are, are very aware of, of this 
relational or, or, or structured database. Years later, computer scientists realized that we could also transform a picture into a structured database. Basically, a pixel can be a number. If we do a number of color, a number of intensity, a number of reflectance, and that's what they did some years ago, ophthalmologists, dermatologists, radiologists, with many studies on AI. More recently, we realized that not only images, but also tests, we can make tests into a structured database to extract all the information from this free text and get a database to do analysis. So let's see some, some of these examples in clinical practice. I really like this study of dermatology. Uh, which used 16,000 cases, out of which 1,000 was, was used to validate the algorithm. Basically, the algorithm was trained with many different diseases and was challenged to distinguish 26 different diseases. It was a strategy that it did it better than primary care physicians, better than specialist nurses, and at least at least as a specialist dermatologists. It was validated in a set that was decided by, by a group of specialized dermatologists. And this kind of artificial intelligence support are already uh, arriving to clinical practice. Actually, in the uh, link you see below, you can access to a platform online in which you can input a photo. For example, I input this photo that I look on the internet and it calculates the passive for you, for all of you that uh, deal with psoriatic arthritis and have challenges calculating the PASI, that at least to me, that will be a very important help in clinical the practice. Also, this can open the door to different ways of managing diseases. For example, a colleague from my, uh, a former colleague from my uh, current hospital did this work in which correlated the images that she took with a mobile phone and used thermography to uh, assess the inflammation of rheumatoid inflammatory arthritis patients and then validated with ultrasound. And she found that the correlation was moderate to good as correlated to the ultrasound. And when she added some other variables such as uh, PROs, patient global assessment, or even CRP, the correlation with CDI or with DAS28 was very strong in these cases, opening the door to telemonitoring to help us know the actual situation of patients when they are at home, thank you to this algorithm. But this is good, we are advancing a lot of imaging, but if you see the evolution, actually imaging started to rise in 2015 approximately, that will happen in the last two, three years, is that this has absolutely exploded. Free text has opened a door to analyze data by a technique called natural language processing. What natural language processing can do is basically take tests and from there extract all the information to get this knowledge from that test. It basically does with different kind of algorithms, not only understanding every word, but also understanding the surrounding, transforming every word into a vector in the way that probably psoriatic arthritis will be a vector in between arthritis and psoriasis, in the way that it will understand the context that erosion is not the same in rheumatology than in dermatology, and it's not the same that in geology. So with natural language processing, we can really understand the tests, and then we can summarize tests, we can create tests, or we can even reply questions. And we have already some examples in research and in clinical practice that can assist us. For example, with uh, the company I have uh, the lab to collaborate with in the last four years, this is basically what we try to do to summarize the free text of electronic health records into an structured database. And basically, we analyze the uh, structured information from this electronic health record, get it from different hospitals to transform it into an aggregated database. Like we did in this study on rheumatoid arthritis and ILD, in which we analyzed nine hospitals with 64 million electronic health records. Imagine 64 million electronic health records. I spent a lot of time as a resident getting the information from electronic health records, but I don't want to imagine how many hours we will spend among all of us 
to recollect all the information. Basically, we collected patients with array, patients with ILD, and look for the intersection to analyze some clinical characteristics and the prevalence of the disease, and also some healthcare resources or even the mortality rate. We have also done it in some uh, in some other diseases such as axial spondyloarthritis or psoriatic arthritis, such as in this study that was smaller, just in three hospitals, but with almost one million patients in these hospitals that we screened to get all the patients with axial spondyloarthritis and with psoriatic arthritis. I will not dive into the, the results, which clinically are not uh, very, very sound. I mean, they, they are aligned with the literature, but the interesting thing is the methodology. And some of you may ask, how do you know that the results that you get are valid, that they are reliable, that they are reproducible? So basically, what we did is a val external validation technique in which the clinicians of the hospitals annotated some of the words that were relevant for a study and then got to a gold standard, which was the agreement of these three annotators. And we compare this with the output of the machine learning model to get some metrics on how good the model read the variables. Besides, we implemented some quality checks to ensure that the population and also the relevant variables were correctly achieved to have reliable and valid results. But I said that also natural language processing can help us to reply questions. And this is basically what ChatGPT does. And I'm sure most of you have already played around with it or even use it as a very useful tool. As many studies are now showing to us that it can help us, for example, in diagnosing. This study showed 36 very difficult clinical cases and confront them to ChatGPT and so that almost an 80% uh, rate of accuracy rate in diagnosis, better than clinicians that were confronted with this test. Actually, you can feel this sense, this sense of accuracy if you realize how much it has, it has improved in replying, question, in replying questions of the USMLE, of the American exam for being a doctor. In December 2022, the best model in natural language processing achieved almost one third percent rate of correct answers. Whereas in last year, one year ago, already almost 90% of correct answers in the USMLE. In the Spanish exam, actually, this year, it was the ChatGPT4 was confronted against the, the Spanish exam and it got more questions, more, more right questions than the number one in the exam. So this is only a thought that it can help us also. To be honest, I have always opened it in my computer when I when I do clinics and I chat with ChatGPT a lot to ask it, okay, are there any interaction of this drug? What do you think of a patient with this and this characteristic? Can you give me alternative uh, differential diagnosis? It can be a very helpful tool. So how can AI help us in the in the coming future? So in my opinion, there are three ways that will come in the in the research field in the in the in the short future first predictive models that can help us give us more information on what inform, what uh, uh, data is relevant to assess patients to treat patients and to treat every patient with the best drug for them then also optimization of clinical trial with external controllers maybe we don't need to have controls for each study, but we can co uh, balance the covariates so that we compare the patient with that drug with patients from real world data. And at the end, we are moving towards hospital data lakes in which we get information not only from unstructured data, but also from laboratory, also from imaging, and we can merge all this data to get the best inputs that we can get from every patient. This is great, right? Artificial intelligence is going to change everything. Well, yes, but as you can imagine, as every incredible technology has many drawbacks and it has many challenges, but I think it's important to confront them, to overcome them. One of them is something that you may have heard of and it's the risk of bias that the data that we input will make the model as good as the data. There is a saying that is garbage in, garbage out what we have in the data will get in the model. And we have to have critical thinking to train the models. Else we can face situations such as this. There are many studies showing 
that if, that there are artificial intelligence algorithms that diagnose better than uh, dermatologists. But I will choose this one as a special because they realize that the size, the ink that was close to the lesion, that helped the algorithm diagnose with malignant lesions a lot. And it, there was there were 40% false positive rates if we did an ink stain in a benign lesion. So we needed to cut the lesion without any ink uh, um, below or, or above so that it could properly diagnose. Also, as you can have probably heard of, generative AI hallucinates. It really doesn't have accountability for what it says. It generates a lot of tests, it generates images, but it really doesn't understand that. And that's why you can face situations such as this. In an article that was retracted only three weeks ago, published in a, in a, one, of, uh, one uh, journal, and the images look really good. They, they are very, very, they, it's incredible that, that this has been done in just two minutes, but they are not really valid. I mean, the, the image of the mouse doesn't make any sense, but especially if you see the jack roots, they have like a dome, they have information that is not really valid. And so you have to have critical thinking when using these AI tools. But if there is a challenge that we need to overcome, is the understanding that all these techniques, all these tools are not here to be better than us, are not here to take out our jobs, but we have to overcome this cultural barrier to understand that they are here just to help us to enhance our, our activities and to make us every day, in every way, better and better to become the best rheumatologist and best researcher that we can. Thank you, Diego, for this uh, very great uh, presentation uh, about the natural uh, processing and uh, broad of the artificial intelligence. I think due to the schedule, I think we will move uh, directly to uh, the presentation of Vicenzo. So Fabian, I'll let you introduce uh, Vicenzo. Yes, absolutely. Maybe just one remark, because I think a uh, brilliant presentation, Diego, and I have to say that I have never used ChatGPT in my clinics yet. And I think this is something that I will definitely take out of the session today, because I think when writing or having just thoughts, brainstorming sessions, but I never used it in clinics. So I think this is definitely something where I will also implement this as well. So without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Vincenzo Venerito, um, and he is both a member of Emoinet and a member of Young Grappa and one of our uh, fascinating colleagues. He is so into uh, artificial intelligence. He just was here at the Digital Rheumatology Days and gave a coding lesson to people without having a strong background in coding. And I think it's, it's so brilliant to have you here with your expertise, Vincenzo, um, as a yeah expert, but also as a friend. Um, he's an assistant professor in rheumatology with a strong um, interest in artificial intelligence and the coding abilities. And so, Vincenzo, the stage is yours. We are really looking forward to hear your presentation on unleashing the potential of artificial intelligence, and especially on psoriatic diseases. Thanks so much, Fabian. Thanks all the conveners for uh, the opportunity of uh, presenting here. So it's clear that uh, artificial intelligence is not merely a trend, but uh, a, a transformative force. In fact, it's, uh, it's uh, destructive potential um, in medicine is vast, ranging from uh, clinical decision making uh, to streamlining health system to empowering um, patients to um, analyze their uh, own data. Actually, um, just like uh, a matryoshka doll containing uh, more detailed dolls uh, inside, we just can consider uh, artificial intelligence uh, having um, uh, layers of uh, increasing sophistication built uh, upon uh, each other to tackle um, greater and greater complexity. At uh, the very simple level, we have uh, machine learning that uh, can handle um, data set of uh, uh, patient data very straightforwardly, but then it comes uh, deep learning allowing for a more complex task like computer vision. And uh, we all know that the uh, rheumatology community uh, is very interested in uh, artificial intelligence because uh, we are interested in uh, uh, ending complexity of uh, um, rheumatic uh, diseases. Uh, we have a lot of intricate interaction uh, uh, in um, uh, the pathogenesis also, um, a lot uh, 
of the variants to uh, entangle with the uh, comorbidities. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, AI can surface a lot of insights to gather more knowledge. And we will know that uh, um, psoriatic arthritis, uh, it's uh, an heterogeneous disease, uh, quite difficult to diagnose and manage. We can have uh, a wide range uh, of uh, uh, joint uh, and uh, skin symptoms. Uh, some uh, uh, domains like the axial involvement may be very uh, difficult uh, to assess. In the end, uh, um, the uh, PSA complexity make it difficult for uh, clinicians uh, uh, to um, predict the uh, outcomes uh, of uh, our treatment to deploy personalized medicine and, uh, and this complexity is exactly where AA shines. For this presentation, we will be guided by the official AI companion of Young Grappa, Say AI. Um, Say AI actually will guide us and when it, um, it's asked um, about uh, its potential in, for the management of uh, PSA, of course, the first point is uh, um, treatment response, predicting treatment response. Um, of course, uh, in this case, uh, um, we have to uh, take into account uh, supervised uh, learning, uh, basically um, machine learning using the supervised model um, account uh, for uh, giving um, to uh, an algorithm a, a data set containing also the uh, correct response it is uh, um, what uh, the word uh, supervised uh, um, uh, means. Uh, the, this is uh, a generic scheme for uh, the, uh, the workflow for uh, uh, prediction modeling. First, uh, we have the data preprocessing step, then we choose and, we, and select the algorithm. We perform internal and external validation. Then we analyze the feature importance to give some model interpretation and explainability, and then we try to deploy um, the um, model uh, after external validation in uh, clinical practice. Uh, machine learning is uh, here uh, is uh, a real deal uh, because of its capability of non-linear relationship. In fact, the assumption that the association between prognostic factor and PSA remission may be an oversimplification, and by basic. Uh, um, by basic assumption, logistic regression is not suitable for the model of non-independent variables and might be inadequate to uh, describe uh, the mechanism of complex diseases such as uh, uh, theoretic arthritis. In this research, uh, um, we, uh, I, I'm showing uh, the potential of uh, uh, extreme gradient boosting uh, a state-of-the-art uh, algorithm, um, a three-based state-of-the-art algorithm that can overperform over uh, logistic regression in predicting the um, treatment response. Actually, the 12 month that's a uh, remission in patient uh, um, undergoing the second chemo treatment. Uh, you see that uh, actually OROC uh, is much greater for uh, ESG boost than uh, logistic regression. And uh, with the three algorithms, we can uh, also. Um, we can also um, demonstrate that uh, baseline DAPSA, fibromyalgia, and axial disease are the most important attribute when the, uh, for uh, the forecasting. Of course, for uh, um, uh, a successful treatment, we need a, a successful uh, disease phenotype recognition. And uh, of course, uh, AI is uh, by our side. Also, uh, in this case, um, will uh, involve uh, unsupervised learning, supervised and learning are unviable where, uh, uh, when uh, we don't have uh, label uh, data, when uh, we want to um, group uh, um, uh, variable to find uh, patient subtypes uh, in our data set. And this is perfectly the case uh, of uh, um, psoriatic arthritis. In this case, I am uh, presenting an interesting study um, an interesting bullying analysis of the trial program of Guselcomab in patients with bio-naive uh, patient, uh, uh, bio uh, PSA and 
undergoing um, uh, guselcumab with non-negative matrix factorization, uh, we can identify uh, eight distinct cluster, cluster one fit dominant, then we have overweight male with psoriasis and dominant, dactylitis the dominant, enthesitis on our joint, enthesitis and, and uh, small joints, axial dominant, and obese female with have joints. And uh, what is more is that uh, actually treatment uh, response vary with the, um, uh, the cluster. And uh, um, so the implication of uh, unsupervised learning for uh, um, clinical practice is, uh, is clear. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, were uh, easy task. Um, computer vision is uh, much more uh, challenging. AI is still with us. Machine learning has potential for medical image recognition. Actually, we are um, we can um, identify sacroiliitis on uh, MRI image analysis, uh, analyzing uh, joint surfaces. We can recognize ILD uh, in uh, CT images. So we can score um, histopathology um, slides. Uh, and uh, years have passed since the seminal work of Jan Lecon, now uh, one of uh, um, the chief the, the, the developer of Meta AI, uh, demonstrating how artificial ne uh, neural network uh, can allow for computer vision. Now we have powerful algorithm like convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks are, um, um, can um, serve as a, a generic feature extraction. Uh, image can be deconvoluted and deconstructed, uh, and they can gain knowledge can gain uh, knowledge about uh, um, simple uh, uh, image um, components uh, like uh, um, lines, shadow, uh, and dots. And this uh, particular uh, um, technology uh, can be deployed for uh, medical imaging. In particular, I'll show you some research from Erlangen Group demonstrating the potential of uh, convolutional neural network uh, applied uh, on uh, CT bone shapes obtained uh, be, uh, with uh, HRPQCT. It is currently the gold standard for visualizing bone in vivo. You see that uh, actually we can uh, um, we can classify inflammatory arthritis. Um, we notice that uh, the OROC for uh, um, PSA in this case is about uh, seventy one percent. Um, if you are asking whether uh, this uh, approach may be uh, also deployed for uh, um, wide, uh, widely available uh, imaging MRI, the answer is yes. In fact. Same group, similar um, approach. We can also the pre-convolutional neural network uh, to um, classify uh, psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. In particular, we can um, uh, deploying a convolutional neural network. We can uh, also recognize uh, seropositive um, array versus PSA with 75 percent uh, accuracy, seventy four percent accuracy for uh, a negative array versus uh, PSA. And uh, we can also deploy convolutional neural network to histopathology slide. This is uh, our implementation. We trained uh, our ResNet 34 uh, using a huge data set of uh, stenovitis microphotographed. In this case, uh, some patients were uh, roughly uh, 30% of the stenovitis microphotographs were obtained um, from, speci from specific on uh, uh, ultrasound guide the synovial biopsy, and you see that uh, this, uh, this task can be performed quite accurately by um, uh, the uh, CNN, uh, which is uh, relying on the, uh, the cellularity of uh, um, sublining and lining exactly, uh, mimicking uh, the uh, CREN score. Of course, the real challenge is to assess axial PSA. In this case, uh, our AI companion is suggesting us to use uh, radiomics. We all know that uh, axial psoriatic arthritis is quite dif difficult to assess, and the categorization conundrum with uh, axial spal ca com comes up a lot of times uh, in rheumatology when uh, analyzing a boundary and uh, overlaps with um, axial spa. We know uh, that uh, we are uh, different uh, genetics and uh, clinic uh, 
clinical characteristics, but uh, of course, um, also um, there are areas of knowledge that uh, are not being explored, like, uh, for instance, the uh, bone marrow edema that we can study with uh, uh, with the radionics, uh, which is a technique that uh, we borrow from oncology. We can extract a, a plethora of information from uh, dark home images, and we can use um, such information for prognostic and diagnostic par uh, purposes. So we can consider that uh, medical image um, imaging is based um, on a, a medium um, ionizing radiation of magnetic field um, impacting uh, a tissue and in physics, such interaction provides a plethora uh, um, of uh, um, parameters, the so-called radiomic feature that can be used by uh, um, machine, uh, um, uh, machine learning. Um, yeah, I'll show you some uh, unpublished research from uh, my group. In this case, uh, we, sorry, in this case, uh, we uh, segmented the bone marrow edema at uh, the sacroiliac joint of patient with the axial PSA and the axial spondyloarthritis. You, um, you can notice uh, how uh, accurate uh, is the segmentation and how fast is the whole process. Then we extract 121 standardized radiomic features. 39 uh, were re um, retained after autocorrelation check. And then we train an extreme valve gradient boosting for um, the um, uh, forecast of the diagnosis of uh, axial SPA versus axial PSA. And the results are quite interesting really, with a, a very good performance of the algorithm. And uh, we also demonstrated that uh, some um, new feature like the texture of the bone marrow edema, its shape and the gray level intensity of the bone marrow edema uh, were the most uh, important feature for um, such a forecasting. So, Actually, um, radiomics can be used uh, as a surrogate di uh, digital biopsy for uh, bone mar marrow edema and further research uh, is needed in, that, um, in these regards. Of course, um, AI is also here for telemedicine. We all know uh, the paths of telemedicine, cost effectiveness, wider accessibility uh, for uh, those living from far from tertiary centers. But we all know also that uh, the main barrier uh, remains the lack of digital surrogate for uh, traditional clinometric like uh, um, wall and joint count and tender joint count. That's why with uh, Professor Thomas Hugel from Lausanne, um, we um, carried out a proof of concept a study called Mephisto to investigate the association between end motion tracking features and, uh, and disease activity. What we did uh, is really simple. We just record um, a video of our um, of our patient making a face, we uploaded that on an app uh, that uh, we developed in a Python environment using the Google MediaPipe uh, API for movement tracking. You see that. Uh, the um, end motion tracking is uh, quite accurate. We measured uh, in five iterations uh, the mean degree um, joint change uh, um, uh, the mean um, change of joint uh, segment angle on flexion and the mean time to maximal flexion. We have a large body of evidence for rheumatoid arthritis. Some very preliminary results for uh, psoriatic arthritis with polyarticular phenotype. In this case, we noticed that uh, the uh, mean degree change of the distal interphalangeal joint uh, uh, could be a predictor of DAPSA uh, LDR, um, of DAPSA low disease activity or, uh, or remission. Um, of course, uh, um, this uh, would be um, a great step forward for uh, um, uh, telemedicine and for uh, uh, digital uh, biomarker. Uh, PSI is uh, a little bit sensitive for uh, uh, comparison with uh, uh, ChatGPT, you all know that uh, ChatGPT revolutionized, uh, re revolutionized uh, uh, our uh, life uh, uh, as uh, researchers, as uh, um, a large language model can serve us uh, as a uh, research assistant uh, drafting our manuscript uh, abstract protocols. They can provide the core uh, code uh, also for uh, statistical analysis, but the large language models also have potential for diagnosis and patient education in rheumatology, as Diego already shown. 
uh, of course, there is the risk of hallucination with the misleading information. This requires physician oversight because uh, um, there are uh, some literature showing that the misleading information uh, from large language models can lead to drug discontinuation of methotrexate, for instance. So collaboration is key uh, for um, safe and effective healthcare large language models and um, international uh, international societies like uh, EULAR uh, and GRAPA should collaborate for providing foundational model by a fine tuning by a retrieval augmented generation. We should combating misinfo to improve large language model reliability, the potential um, for diagnosis of large language models uh, um, can be depicted uh, with um, this, uh, this study. We test uh, um, three large language models, uh, Anthropic Cloud uh, version two. Now we have uh, version three, GPT-4 and Google Bard. At the time, Gemini was not available. Uh, on, we test that uh, on uh, 58 uh, vignettes and uh, from Lancet Rheumatology. And actually, we found that uh, Claude and GPT-4 uh, had uh, the same success rate, um, even if uh, it dropped significantly when dealing with uh, differential diagnosis, carrying and common involvement on infection of uh, infectious diseases. In that case, Claude appeared uh, to be uh, slightly better than GPT-4. In the end, AI enables multidimensional assessment uh, of complex diseases like sclerotic arthritis. Um, potentially, PSI management can be revolutionized from uh, um, treatment response to uh, telemedicine, and uh, we should collaborate uh, for ethical data sharing and, col and uh, as uh, it's uh, really crucial for improving model accuracy and uh, uh, also to provide safe large language models. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vincenzo, and thank you, Diego, as well, because I think this was really a tour de France around the hot topics of artificial intelligence. I really enjoyed both your presentations. Um, I think we should open up the stage also for questions from the audience. So if you are there, if you have any uh, specific questions or general questions to the experts, um, please feel free to type them in the chat or even just um, open up your mic and ask the question uh, specifically and directly because I think this is a great opportunity. And just one short remark also in your direction, Vincenzo, because as said, I, I think you saw me smiling and really enjoying your presentation uh, while you were speaking. But to be fair also for artificial intelligence, because as long as the experts do not agree what actual PSA is. Um, it will always be hard also for artificial intelligence. Maybe it can help us to get better to the point of it, but as long as the one person in the room says, well, this is just arbitrary and these are all the same patients, it will always be hard to find a, a clear solution just to mention this. Absolutely. Also because uh, that is uh, supervised learning. So. Uh, actually, data comes uh, labeled by um, actually um, expert uh, by a clinician, but uh, of course uh, there is still room for debating what uh, clearly is uh, um, axial spondyloarthritis and axial psoriatic arthritis, even if for that uh, study we follow um, classification criteria. And we know that um, overlaps uh, uh, can uh, actually occur uh, okay. in that case. Anyway, uh, I think that uh, as Diego uh, um, uh, said before, the important in this case uh, is to acknowledge a new methodology to study a, um, an aspect of marrow edema that uh, is very hard um, to uh, analyze uh, and assess. Yeah and use the power of artificial intelligence because it can just be fast it can assess um, big data in such a short amount of time and it really gives us a, an advantage. We have a first question coming in from Abir Aloui from Morocco and I think this is a very important question and I think we can target this to both Diego and you uh, Vincenzo because you are the experts for this. How um, can we enhance our skills in developing digital medicine because I think we all we are young rheumatologists here and when we are looking into the future, and this is not only about two or three years, but when thinking about a decade from now, I think it will just be our clinical practice. And how, what would you be your advice for us? How can we improve our skills in digital medicine so that we can stay up to date? 
No, I yeah. I can go. Uh, so yeah, thank you for this question, which is really interesting. Uh, at this point, uh, I think there we can differentiate by two ways of of learning. One is in generative AI, there are already many tools that are available for everyone. And, and I think the way of learning is just by using them, just by daring to use them for every task we do. For example, for research, uh, use the imagination to, to know how it can support us, to support us in every way, uh, aspect of, of, of our clinical research, since the, the uh, ideas of the protocol, medical writing, uh, uh, statistical analysis, and just try and iterate, even if the first time we don't get what we want, just keep on, on pushing and, and, and learning more and more. Uh, there is another aspect, particularly in discriminative AI, which is basically to understand the, the myriad of studies that are appearing. And for this, uh, my recommendation will also be to start reading them and try to, to dissect them. And uh, for example, ChatGPT is a, is a good uh, help to, the, to, to learn them. Uh, you can just paste one of, of the uh, studies that you don't understand and ask ChatGPT to explain it to you. Please explain this to me as if I were a 10 year old and then that way you will start learning more and more and then if you want to get the level of Vincenzo of coding I think Vincenzo you can you can tell us how because that's pretty amazing <laughs> two words two words Lamp Lamp Python. Um, that's the very uh, I think that uh, the, the most important su suggestion uh, is uh, to learn to code this is a, a fundamental skill also for rheumatologists um, Essentially, uh, also uh, to critically uh, analyze and understand uh, studies, as uh, Diego said. In fact, uh, one of the main issues in machine learning research at, at the moment is standardization together with the reproducibility. When you review a paper and you don't see um, uh, even just one step of that work for, for a supervised model, this is an auto-reject. In, uh, in most uh, um, uh, paper review. This is uh, uh, for the sake of standardization, for the sake of the uh, reproducibility. You have some wonderful source, one for, uh, uh, for instance, is uh, deep learning uh, uh, .ai um, uh, with uh, the batch newsletter uh, is um, the site of uh, Andrew Angie uh, from uh, Stanford is a great source uh, for uh, learning. In the end, uh, go with Python, uh, go with uh, one of the wide, um, uh, widely available uh, course uh, in Python for machine learning, code, 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 you'll uh, have some serious fun and in the end uh, you'll uh, succeed uh, in uh, deploying uh, digital medicine. I think we have another question in the chat. So the question is, do we have an answer for how fast AI learns? They are planning a study on the accuracy of AI, but it's a big challenge to determine the time points or for how frequently we need to ask questions to AI hour, one day, what, two weeks. Well, maybe in sense you can also complement on this. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I will say that it depends a lot on 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 the objective of the study, on the uh, on the data you have, and also the, on the methodology. So basically, it depends uh, a lot on 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 what you want to 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 look for, right? Absolutely. This is a, um, a matter of aim. You, you first uh, um, describe your aim and then there is a, a, a probate methodology to um, push it, uh, that aim. This question can have a lot of answers depending on what uh, um, you are studying. For instance, you go with the, um, uh, supervised learning and you want to, uh, to see how many batches of data you need to improve your uh, forecasting. So how long should be uh, your data set? You go with an um, uh, algorithm with the, the trend with different uh, batches number to see how it can improve. This uh, study design um, could, uh, could take uh, about uh, 
10 to uh, 15 minutes uh, with uh, um, uh, an, uh, an apple silicon M1 um, microchip. Then if you have uh, um, to deal with the image, you will uh, have uh, to take into account cloud computing to have a powerful uh, NVIDIA uh, GPU. And uh, this will take maybe hours and days. Uh, so actually, First, uh, maybe you have to refine first your study design and then there is a, an appropriate answer um, to um, uh, this question that uh, we can provide. Of course, uh, I think, uh, Diego, we are here also for, uh, absolutely for uh, answering question also uh, aside from, uh, from this webinar. So feel free also to yeah. mail us uh, if you want. Totally. In the matter of time, I think we should uh, wrap it up with the last question from Lise. Uh, she's asking that IE models are very often trained on a part of a specific data set patient population and then uh, validated in a uh, um, yeah, testing cohort again. What do you think that training an IE model this way is prone to selection bias and when applying it to data on variable outsides such as data sets, would it then apply less well and therefore be less truthworthy compared to the application on the data set on which the model is trained? Absolutely. Yeah, totally, totally. That, that's a very important point that also is mentioned by all the guidelines on AI. For example, there is tripod guidelines that uh, insist on the importance of external validation because if we have a model that is very well trained in their data, and it has what it called overfitting to this data and then it doesn't apply to external data, that's probably not, uh, not a good model. So that's, it's basically what we have to train models in, in our local, I mean, in our data, but they also validate and, and reply their, their performance in, in external databases. Okay, I think thank you so much. Thank you, so sir. You, yeah, thank you for organizing this. And I think we also have to thank Crystal again because she was setting most of this up and was organizing and, and um, she's attending. I, I saw that Christella was connecting, but uh, yeah. So so really thanks uh, to uh, everyone. Uh, so it's time to close this first webinar. I would like to thank our two uh, speakers that were very brilliant, and I think we learned a lot of this potential. Uh, I would like also to thank Fabian for the moderation, and thank you all for attending this webinar and. Uh, I hope to see you for another one. Absolutely. Thank you also, Jean-Guillaume. And I think the very important point was the take-home message from both Diego and Vincenzo, because we are running short of time. This is such a hot topic, and it will gain even more importance over the next, uh, next decades. So if you have specific questions, you now heard the experts from both Simonet and Jan Grapper, and they would be happy if you reach out to them for specific questions, advice, or collaborations. And I think this would be great to enhance the collaboration even further. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for organizing. Such a pleasure being here with you guys tonight.